morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. My name is DJ Martin. I'm the church pastor here at Parker Ford Church. It's great to have you with us, whether you're a member at Parker Ford or just joining us online. Today, we are continuing our Advent series, and the theme of our Advent series is waiting on God. We've been exploring what it was like to be an ancient Israelite in the first century who had been waiting for their Messiah for centuries, waiting for the promised anointed one, waiting for for the king to come, for the prophet like Moses, waiting for the high priesthood to be restored. And we've been exploring this each week during Advent and looking at that and then looking at what it's like to wait in our own lives today because we continue to wait on the Lord to fulfill his promises. Even though we've already received the Messiah, even though we already know Jesus and we have the New Testament and the scriptures, We are still waiting for God to make all things new. And so that's what this series has been all about, waiting on the work of God and what it's like to wait for him to do the things he's promised. Today we'll be talking about what it's like to wait when it hurts. Sometimes waiting is uncomfortable. Sometimes there's discomfort when it comes to having to wait for something. But sometimes it moves past discomfort into pain. And sometimes waiting hurts. And there's stories from the scripture of waiting on God and the pain in the unknown and the pain in the passing of time, waiting for him to make things right, waiting for him to fulfill his promises. We're going to be looking at that today. Throughout this morning, we want to invite you to engage and interact with the service. When you see the red speech bubble on your slide, on your screen, that's your chance to pause the video and have a discussion with those you're with in your home or or um, at your dining room table or in your living room. Or if you're by yourself, you can also pause the video, pull out a pen and paper, and just reflect on the questions. Spend time meditating. So engage the content throughout the morning. We're going to start with the call to worship from Psalm 119, verses 143 to 152. One of our elders here at Parker Ford Church, Carol Daring, will be reading the word from Psalm 119. So would you join her in the reading of God's word? Please stand for the reading of God's word, Psalm 119, 143 through 152. Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise up before dawn and I cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord. According to your justice, give me life. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. When you think of a time that it was painful to have to wait for the fulfillment of a promise or a hoped for an outcome. Think about that. And then can you think of an example of someone in the Bible who may have experienced either physical or emotional pain as they waited for God's promise? Wow. Think about both of those questions kind of um, ponder them. Today in our sermon, we're continuing our series through Advent of Waiting on God. And today we're specifically talking about when waiting hurts. There's so many stories in scripture of the people of God having to wait generations, having to wait years and years and years for the fulfillment of God's promise. Sometimes that waiting, the waiting on God to fulfill his promise can cause discomfort in our lives. It can cause maybe a shaking of our faith, of our belief, of our hope in God. 
But sometimes waiting for God to fulfill his promise, waiting for God to redeem, waiting for God to rescue, moves past discomfort into the point of, of real legitimate pain. And there's lots of stories about that too um, in the scriptures. We started this series a few weeks ago with the prophetic cry from Habakkuk 1 where the prophet cries out, How long, O Lord? And we ended that service reading from Psalm 13 where David repeatedly says at the beginning of that psalm, How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? You get this sense from both Habakkuk and from David that there wasn't just discomfort, there was a pain, there was, there was a hurt, there was an ache as they cried out to the Lord asking him, how long until you make things right? Well, in this series, we've been talking about what it was like for the people of God to wait for the Messiah. And then applying that to our own lives, what is it like for us to wait for him to make all things new? Because even though we have the great benefit and privilege of living after Christ, and so we can look back upon his life, and we can read the stories in the scriptures, and we have the Holy Spirit living within us, his work is not yet complete. He has not yet fulfilled all of the things that he has promised he will do. He is making all things new, he says. He's going to end all of sin and rebellion against him. He's recreating the earth. We will share fully in his resurrection. And so even though we, the people of God, look back on history, you know, for thousands of years now, we look back on church history, we continue to look forward into the future and waiting on God to fulfill his promise. And perhaps you're in a season of waiting that has moved past discomfort and is painful. Perhaps a loved one is struggling with, with a disease. Perhaps your marriage is struggling. Perhaps you're waiting for God to redeem a relationship with, with a spouse or with a child or with a loved friend. And the pain of waiting um, can be so Hurtful. So what we're going to be talking about in today's sermon is, is that, what it's like to wait when it hurts. And we're going to be looking at the scriptures and the birth of Christ um, as we continue our Advent season. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 1 and Luke 1 and asking the question, what was it like for Mary to wait? Was there pain in the waiting uh, for the fulfillment, not just for Mary, but for, for the people of Israel in general? Before we get into the scripture, we're going to look at Matthew 1 and Luke 1. This morning, before we get into those uh, chapters of the scripture, would you pray with me and let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak through his word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures and the gift of the story of Jesus, your son who became a child and grew up to be a man who lived in the flesh, fully God, fully man. In this Christmas season, during this season of Advent, with just a few days left before we celebrate Christmas as a society, Lord, we, we pause this morning to remember that it was no accident when you sent your son. It was, as Paul writes in Galatians, at just the right time, in the fullness of time, you sent forth your son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. We stand in redemptive history this morning in the inheritance of that redemption. Father, we pray that you would teach us more through your word today, that you would guide us and help us to become more like you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, we're going to read a little bit about the birth story of Christ, or at least leading up to it. Luke includes details that none of the other gospel writers include about the birth of John the Baptist as well as the birth of, of Jesus. Luke is the one who tells us about Jesus being a boy in the temple, about growing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Luke is also the one who tells us about the conversation between the angel Gabriel and Mary in the most detail. Starting in verse 26, Luke reports this, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Verse 30, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. 
For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Verse 36, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with waiting and waiting in pain? This is the famous Christmas story, and most of us have heard this, um, you know, with children playing parts in in a Christmas pageant or with a Charlie Brown special on in the background or the reading around the Christmas tree as a family, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's helpful for us to put ourselves in the shoes of the people of the story of the scriptures and what it was like. Ask the question, what was it like for them? You know, we, we're so far removed from this time and culture that maybe it's been um, glamorized a little bit or softened what it would have been like because we need to remember a couple things about this story. Number one is Mary is very, very young. She's likely anywhere between 14 to 16, maybe 17 at the most years old. She's She's in her adolescence. She's a young, young woman. And she's betrothed to a man, Joseph. So they're engaged. They're promised to one another. They're moving towards marriage in their culture. And Joseph was likely twice her age. He would have been uh, probably about 30 years old. He's um, established himself and is ready uh, for marriage. And so here's this young woman, this young girl in many ways, And this angel shows up, Gabriel shows up to her and says, you are going to be impregnated. And of course, one of Mary's questions is, how is this possible? I've never been with a man. I'm a virgin. And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Now, there's a cost here that Mary is going to have to walk out. Because in this time and culture, think about how a woman of her age who is not yet married would have been treated when she's found to be with child. John chapter 8 includes the famous story where Jesus is in Jerusalem and a woman is brought before him uh, by some of the leaders and she's the woman caught in adultery. And they say, the law says this woman must be stoned to death. What do you say? And Jesus says the famous line, Um, Let he who is without sin be the first to cast the stones. And so it says, starting with the oldest down to the youngest, they drop their stones. Meanwhile, Jesus is writing in the the dust. We don't know what he's writing, but he's writing something in the dust. And starting with the oldest to the youngest, they walk away. And he looks up, and the woman is still there. And he says, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. And he says, neither do I. But then he says, but go and sin no more. Now, this woman caught in adultery, she was about to be stoned, stoned to death. And according to the Levitical law, that was the punishment for this kind of sin. Mary, this young girl, there's a cost. There's a cost to what God is asking her to do. And uh, she would have been looked down upon. She would have been ridiculed. And she likely would have faced some actual real physical threat, physical danger, um, because the assumption by everyone would have been that she was sleeping around, that she had been with a man other than Joseph. How are women um, who give birth to children outside of wedlock treated um, in our culture? How are they often looked at in our culture, let alone first century Israel? Now, Matthew, in his account, he fills in some of the details about how this may have been perceived by Joseph, as well as the type of character that Joseph had. So here's Joseph, betrothed to this young woman, and she is suddenly found to be with child. And she's telling this story about an angel appearing to her and saying that the Holy Spirit is coming upon her. 
And this was certainly, at the very least, a troubling thing, I'm sure, for Joseph to hear. And he was probably wrestling through, is she this young girl who's in trouble and now she's trying to get her way out of it? Now we find out from this passage in Matthew 1 that, that Joseph doesn't actually want to harm her to his great credit. He, he wants to care for her, but he's also not comfortable moving forward. And so Matthew tells us some of the details about how he plans on moving forward. It says in Matthew 1 verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, he doesn't want to punish her, he doesn't want to ridicule her, he doesn't want everyone to look down on her or or, uh, cause her harm, so he resolved to divorce her quietly, but he's not comfortable moving forward with things. Verse 20 says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. There's a cost, there's a pain that comes with waiting. Joseph has these questions that would have been painful for Mary to experience, but then all of culture, all of the people she would have interacted with, would have watched this young woman's belly grow week by week, and they would have whispered probably behind her back and wagged their their heads and, you know, shook their fingers and said, you know, can you believe what, what she's done? There's a cost and sometimes waiting is painful. There's so many example, examples of painful waiting in Scripture. And so many of the examples of painful waiting in Scripture actually have to do with barren women who are waiting, praying, crying out that God would allow them to have a child. Think about Sarah and Abraham. For years, they're crying out and Sarah is barren. She's unable to have children. But then the Lord um, intercedes. The Lord imparts to them Uh, the gift of Isaac. Then the very next generation, Rebecca is barren, and it says that Isaac prayed for her, and she has both Jacob and Esau. And then the next generation, Rachel is barren, and finally gives birth to Joseph. Or the story of Hannah in the book of Samuel. Hannah is barren, and she's praying, and she's crying out in the temple in, in the tabernacle, excuse me, and the, the priest, Eli, comes and she, he thinks she's drunk and he rebukes her and she says, I'm not drunk, I'm crying out in anguish. And then the Lord answers her and she has the child Samuel. Or Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1 in the birth story of Christ, his cousin um, John the Baptist is born to a barren woman, Elizabeth, who has been praying and crying out that she might have a child. For each of these examples of waiting, there was pain, the pain of waiting for the fulfillment. And then there was the pain that followed in the labor pains. Labor pains become a repeated theme themselves throughout Scripture. So Mary would have gone through labor pains. Have you ever thought about that? Um, You know, the labor that Mary would have been in when they're in Bethlehem and there's no place for them and they're looking for a place and they end up um, in in this barn-like setting among the animals and in pain she's giving birth uh, to this child. In the scriptures, this becomes a repeated theme of the pain of waiting, the child uh, labor pains. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 8, all of these signs that he's talking about are the beginning of birth pains. Or Paul uses that in several places. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, he says, while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Or in the famous passage in Romans chapter 8, Paul says that all of creation, all of, <laughs> all of cosmos, the entire universe and the earth is groaning in expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. This groaning that he's talking about is a labor pain of waiting for God to fulfill his promise. And this is the type of waiting that we experience today. Now, God was faithful to Mary. 
And he was faithful to all of these women that I just listed. And he is faithful to us. He will fulfill his promise. He will make all things new. But as we wrap up of the teaching portion of today's service, I want to invite you to reflect on the following questions and then potentially to put some of these things into your own application in your life. What do you think it means for all of creation to be groaning in expectation for the children of God to be revealed? In other words, all of creation is experiencing labor pains, the pain of waiting for God to fulfill his promise. What Was there a time when Jesus experienced pain in a period of waiting on God? This is a good question to ponder. Was there a time that you can think of, and, there, and there's several that I can think of, but was there a time when Jesus experienced, experienced the pain of waiting for God? One vital spiritual discipline is the practice of celebration. I want to invite you to celebrate the ways that God has fulfilled his promises in your life and family. And I'd like to invite you as families to make a family art project around a list of the things that you're celebrating together. Can you come up with some creative way as a family or as a couple or just in your own, on your own, if you're alone, in your home to celebrate what God has done with your life? So go ahead and reflect on these questions and then you can join us for the benediction of today's service. Please stand for the benediction, Psalm 119. Love the Lord because he had, has heard my voice, my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ears to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. They, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. May you go in peace. God bless you.